she writes and talks about a side of healthcare that no drug, no technology, no omics research can help us with. How do we and our doctors confront chronic diseases and face life-threatening illnesses? When is intervention worth pursuing? How do we care at the end of life? How does healthcare shape who we are? And most profoundly, what constitutes a life worth living? These are topics she writes about in her much celebrated book and love story, My Foreign Cities, a memoir. And we're honored that she is going to share her deeply grounded reflections with us today. Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you, Larry, so much for inviting me and all of you for sticking it out till the last session. If you need to get up and stretch, please feel free. Um, and more for your interest in healthcare. You'll soon realize when I start talking um, why I'm so grateful for all your work, whether you are researchers or doctors or nurses or art therapists. Whatever you do, um, it's personally meaningful to me and I hope you'll keep doing your work. Um, it's also especially for, nice for me to be here at CU, which is a few blocks from my childhood home and played an unwitting part in shaping my adolescence. Um, you know, when you're a, a kid in a college town, you're always in this war with the college students that they don't know is going on. Um, so we were always staking out our territory and we'd go to Norland to do our research projects and sneak into the stadium and hang out at night. And uh, we always walked through campus down to high school, sort of absorbing the possibilities that college would offer us later. So the story I'm here to tell you begins actually back then, right down the hill at Boulder High in a high school history class in a current events discussion. I was lost in thought when I heard someone across the aisle say that they thought it was right that Reagan had bombed Libya. So first of all, how at 17 would you know? I was offended by that. And I looked up, and it was coming from this boy across the aisle whose name was Stephen Evans, who was very cute, he was very smart, and he was funny, and he had to be shut down. So, you know, <laughs> against my will, I joined the discussion, and the two of us just started arguing daily. Um, and eventually, we became friends. And then we went out, and then we broke up, and we went to college, and we went our separate ways. And somewhere in college, we admitted we were in love with each other. And I moved out to San Francisco to be with him after school. So what in the world does that have to do with modern medicine or the future of healthcare? Um, well, Stephen had cystic fibrosis, which is a progressive genetic disease that cause, causes buildup of mucus in the lungs and the digestive system. And when he was born in 1968, the average life expectancy for a person with CF was about 10 years. Obviously, Stephen was a rarity. When I met him in high school, he took enzymes to digest his food, but other than that, he was like the rest of us. In fact, he was often spearheading the rest of us, um, climbing at Sanitas or you know, biking up um, Flagstaff or whatever we were doing. He did know that his life would likely be short, but his knowledge, it was really theoretical. It was hard for it to be any other way at 17. But while we were busy being teenagers, researchers were making major breakthroughs in the field of cystic fibrosis. So when we were arguing in that classroom, the first successful double lung transplant was performed on a person with CF. Um, when we were in college, the gene that holds the CF mutation was discovered, spurring all kinds of new preventative treatments, not to preventative the illness, but to prevent the sy symptoms. Um, and the research has continued at a rapid pace. In 2012, I'm sure all of you know, the first drug uh, was manufactured that actually treats the underlying causes of CF in one particular mutation that affects 2% of the population. So these discoveries changed the landscape of cystic fibrosis dramatically. When Stephen was born, it was a really finite, circumscribed world. Um, I have a friend who has CF, and she's actually 45 and still doing well. And she said when she was a kid, she stopped believing in a cure for CF around the same time she stopped believing in the tooth fairy. She just said it was this thing grown-ups talked about to pretend that everything was going to be OK. But with these changes, um, the mindset really shifted if not about the possibility for a cure, at least about the possibility for a longer and healthier life. So we've talked a lot about the, over the past few days about the frontiers of medicine, and I'm here to add to that conversation. I do have to admit, when Larry asked me, I wondered if he'd meant Elizabeth Scarborough, the molecular biologist, 
um, in part for my lack of slides, <laughs> as you will notice. Um, but I do have something to add to that conversation, which is a, a perspective of life from inside the Petri dish. Um, it is a narrow, close-up, ground floor view, and I'm hoping it will add to and even deepen the bigger conversation. Um, so if I can make a slide move, I'll see what happens. No, I guess I can't. Well, we'll see. Maybe you don't need to see anything. You might see me and Stephen in a second. Oh, sorry. I'm left-handed, so I'm holding it wrong. There we go. So that's us um, in high school. And I was going to tell you that I remember the moment that I realized I was viewing medicine from the inside. Um, I was at college, University of Chicago, in a biomedical ethics class. And I had loved this class so far. The professor had an MD and a JD, and he would lure us into these fiery debates on cloning and euthanasia. Um, well, I came into class a little late with my coffee to see the words genetic engineering written on the board. And today, we were going to be talking about cystic fibrosis. And I sank low in my seat as my classmates started talking about you know, whether with people with CF should be born, whether it's good that they can't reproduce, whether we should really think about even spending money on the last years of their life, because they're very expensive. So these are painful questions, but they're valid questions. And being on the receiving end of medical advances meant facing them. Questions that are theoretical for most people became, for me and Stephen, things you talk about over breakfast. You know, if you can't breathe, a lung transplant sounds incredible, but at what personal risk and cost? At what societal risk and cost? Who gets to have a transplant? Who's going to pay for the transplants? How do you create an ethical waiting list? Um, the advances in medicine are also more, more momentous and complicated, seen from the inside. If you take just the increase in life expectancy for someone with CF, um, when Stephen was alive, it seemed to inch up a year for his every year, which was super relaxing. Um, but it is now at 37 and a half, which sounds and is incredibly young. But inside that life, an extra year, an extra 365 days here on Earth was momentum. I mean, we, we toasted each other every time that number went up. Advances also have complications and consequences that you don't expect. So when Stephen was growing up, kids with CF went to um, camps in the summer for CF camps. And Stephen never went because he was healthy, but I have friends who went to those camps. And it was the highlight of their year. It was this place where they found other people who understood them, um, not only their experience, but their outlook on life, something that their parents didn't even really understand. Well, then, of course, it became clear that people with CF can pass dangerous affections back and forth. So the next year, there were no camps. And kids could no longer share hospital rooms, something that wasn't healthy, but was something that they had always looked forward to and made their hospital stays um, so much better. Um, so when I think about how life inside the Petri dish, um, what characterizes it, how it's different from my life now, what might be worth exploring, I think of the way three things play out. Um, uncertainty, hope, and making decisions. Um, so let me, this is, I'm sorry, I'm not good with this thing. <laughs> okay, this is, I just moved out to San Francisco to be with Stephen. I'd left college, I'd finished college. Um, and <laughs> that's important. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, we were on our way to a party. We were driving down Fillmore Street, and he pulled the car over. And I, he was such a good driver, I was like, what happened? His lung had collapsed. Um, and I was terrified. He was relaxed. He had had a lung collapse before. He was too relaxed, and I apologize if there are any pulmonologists in the office because he said, in the auditorium, because he said, um, you know, I think I'd like to go in tomorrow morning because the emergency room is packed on Saturday nights. And stupidly, I said, okay, because I didn't know. Um, so the next morning, I drove him over to the hospital. And, um, you know, he got a chest tube in, and they said, okay, his lung's going to heal, and in about a week, you can come get him. So the day I was supposed to come get him, he called me, and he said, my lung collapsed again. Well, I was indignant because, in my mind, I had no experience with the uncertainty of medicine. So I just said, but they said when it heals, not if, you know. And he was, like, very impatient with that. He said, they don't know exactly what they're doing. They're just trying to figure this out. So a week later, the lung was still not healing. And I was sitting in his hospital bed with him while his doctor, Dr. Stuhlbarg, was talking with us. And he said, you know, the lung's not healing. I think we're going to have to try something more. And I winced, and Stephen nodded. 
He loved Dr. Stuhlbarg. Um, he loved that he had been a philosophy major in college, and he admitted the complexity of all of this. Um, and in that moment, he was talking about a procedure called pleurodeses, which involves, which they don't do anymore, which involves injecting the lung with tetracycline so it scars to the point that it sticks to the lung, ch the chest cavity. So, um, you know, the results are good. The procedure sounded prehistoric. And I was like, that sounds really painful. And Dr. Stolberg said, oh, it's going to be painful. Um, and I felt my own affection for him, the way that he looked me in the eye when he said this. And he said, but on the other hand, you know, the lung will not collapse again. And there were so many moments of this, of just being blindsided by something and having no idea what to do and just trying to figure it out. Um, but surprisingly, living with uncertainty is not all bad. Um, I remember being on a mountain peak with my family. We were backpacking in, I think, high school. Um, and we're on a peak at noon, which those of you from Colorado know is a really bad idea. We were knee deep in snow. A family friend was carrying the dog. And I was so mad, you know. And I said to my dad, we are exhausted and we're lost. And he said, I know. Isn't it great? And I was like, ah, you know. Well, it was great. It was great partly because we got off the mountain and got home. Um, and I think living with uncertainty really felt that way to me. We were always shifting back and forth between feeling more alive and being sort of pushed over the edge. It did allow us a particular kind of freedom and a chance to chart our own course. Um, not to say that it didn't leave you reeling, because it does. So. Oh my goodness, I got a little confused. I'm so sorry. Um, uncertainty also allowed Stephen to become more proactive um, in shaping the parts of his healthcare that he could shape. He got very interested in cystic fibrosis in medicine. He went to graduate school in public health with the hopes of making healthcare available universally. Um, he jumped into research studies. You guys would have loved him. <laughs> um, he was, you know, always on board for the next thing, and sometimes I actually had to hold him back. When he had gone to graduate school, he was taking, you know, a four-course load at Harvard, and he was managing his hospital visits, you know, with his finals, and he got a letter from Columbia about being in a gene therapy trial, and he was like, I'm just gonna go, you know, they'll fly me down there, I'll do it, I'll stay overnight, and they'll fly me right back. Once, it's only once a month, and I just was like, you know, we don't have time to go to the movies. You cannot go <laughs> to Columbia and do this study. But I think those opportunities made him feel like he was um, giving back, and also that he had an active role in his health rather than being someone who was acted upon. Um, I think uncertainty also, it, it also sort of shaped the way that we could survive the illness. It, the trick seemed to, lay, to lie in adaptation. So for instance, when Stephen was, um, for most of his life, he had to work really hard to keep weight on, so he always had like a peanut butter sandwich and whole milk right before bed. At a certain point, his doctor decided that it might be good for him to get a stomach tube so that he could ingest extra calories at night. So he went from you know, worrying about food all day to not really having to think about it too much, but then his nights were inconvenienced. Well, after he got a transplant, his weight, he had a weight gain, unprecedented weight gain. He gained 50 pounds. You've never seen someone so excited to gain 50 pounds. He was thrilled. He never had to think about his weight again. On the other hand, he now took 30 medications a day and there were tons of crazy side effects. So he had to deal with that. So the ground beneath him, and by extension beneath me, was always shifting. And it seemed that the trick really was in surfing those shifts. If you could sort of be nimble and lose, you know, change your expectation to what you had been experiencing to the thing that was coming around the corner, you'd be okay. Um, along with the uncertainty of every advance came hope. And for those of you who haven't experienced, you, you know, the hope of a new advance is, it's not a small thing. It can be life-changing, it can be crushingly empty, it can be complicated, it can be all three of those things at once, um, but it's never small. And I think for patients, um, you're often living the thread of hope and acceptance at the same time. And when I think about that, I think about my student, um, Rosie Perez, who was in my sixth grade class the year after Stephen died. So Rosie also had CF, and unfortunately she was not nearly as lucky as Stephen was. When she was 11, her health was about, she was about as limited as he was at 27. Um, Rosie, you know, honesty was important to Rosie, but I mean, <laughs> hope was important, but equally important was honesty, and she had this sort of dark sense of humor. I remember her saying to her mother, um, your mother would go out to the store and she'd say, well, hope I'm gonna still be here when you get back. 
And you know, her mother teared up when she told me this, and Rosie said, I'm sorry, I thought it was funny. You know, <laughs> she did actually think it was funny. Um, so she loved to ask me all about Stephen, and I told her what I thought he would have wanted me to tell her. And when she was in seventh grade, at the end of the year, her lung collapsed, and another teacher and I went to go visit her in the hospital. So I come in the room, and she sits up in her bed really fast, and she holds my hand, and she says, Miss Scarborough, I think what happened to your husband is happening to me. And I said, oh, you know, your lung collapsed. He had like six lung collapses. And she just gave me this look like, you are the adult here. You can do better than that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Come on. And so I said, so you think you're dying? And she said, yeah. And she said, can you tell me what it was like for Stephen? And so I did. You know, I told her that time slowed down. I told her that we were all holding him. And that in my honest assessment, those last minutes, he was relaxed and he was OK. And she said, oh, so it's not like all the blood and guts in the movies, right? And I said, no, no, it's nothing like the movies. Um, so we talked a little while longer. So Rosie died the next day. And she had known. And she, what she needed in that moment from the rest of us was to meet her where she was. Um, and you know, all along, for a very long time, the hope that we all had for her had buoyed her up. But then she shifted, and she needed something else. So that shift is not easy for patients or loved ones, I can confess. Um, or doctors. Right now, you know, there's a lot of talk and writing about how doctors and patients need to have these last, you know, these conversations about death and the end of the life. And I think that's true. But I also think it's difficult to instigate those conversations on both sides of that equation. Stephen and I were really lucky. Um, his doctor was very comfortable talking with us about um, the end of life and about mortality in general. I can remember him saying to Stephen, you know, okay, so you don't know how long you have. What do you want to do with the time that you have? And that allowed us to live more meaningfully. And it also, um, he would acknowledge what he couldn't control and what we couldn't control. And that gave us, in some ways, more control. Um, one of the funny things about living on the frontiers of modern medicine is, while you do p feel a profound lack of control, there seems also to be decisions to be made like around every corner. And I got my first inkling of this with that lung collapse in San Francisco. You know, when I sat on the bed and I was just tired, and I was 21, and I just wanted Dr. Stolberg to tell Stephen what to do. Um, of course, over time, I became grateful that he got to help chart his own, own course. Um, when we were in our early 20s, our life was pretty normal. And he, his health, you know, he had bouts of trouble, but for the most part was good. We worked and we went to school. We hung out with our friends. We got married when we were 25. These are my brief slides. I didn't hit it twice. That's us getting married um, up here at Gold Hill. And during those years, he made all of his own medical decisions. Um, I was barely informed, really. He was very proactive and on top of things. He was the kind of person who you know, paid his bills on time and fixed loose doorknobs whenever he saw them. So I never thought about it much. Um, after we moved to Boston, pretty soon after we got married, his health started to decline. And it came more to the forefront of both of our lives. And we found ourselves making more decisions together. Um, when he was 27, his doctor in Boston suggested that he consider getting on the list for a double lung transplant. So this was 1996. And it sounded great in the sense that you know, he was wearing oxygen at night, and it was hard to get around a few blocks, and it would be sort of a miracle. On the other hand, at that point, one in 10 people survived the surgery, and one in two people survived the first five years. So it was terrifying, and we talked about it endlessly. And we finally decided that it was terrifying, and yet it also felt right. Um, so we moved back to California for him to get on the transplant list, the timing of which is a decision in and of itself. You have to be sick enough to desperately need the transplant, but healthy enough to be able to sustain the new lungs once you get them. And I remember being in the transplant clinic um, when we were talking about this, and Dr. Golden said, you know, when do you want to get on the list? And Stephen looked at me, and he's, he just, Dr. Golden broke into this big smile, and he said, oh, young couples, still making your decisions together. You know, the couch, the car, the transplant. <laughs> we were like, yeah, we are. <laughs> um, and so we, Stephen got on the list, and this is us, maybe us in Hawaii, the week before he got on the list. So he got on the list, and two weeks later, we got a call at midnight. Um, he didn't even have, I know, he did not even have time to get a pager. It was, the wait list, the average wait list was a year. I think it was because he was a small person, but in any case. Um, he, we got a call at midnight, and I drove him across the Bay Bridge, 
You know, we called our families, and 24 hours later, he had new lungs. Um, it was incredible. The transplant went incredibly well. Um, it was not long before he could bike and hike and travel again. He went to work. You'd never seen someone so happy to go to work <laughs> in your life. Um, he just got to be 28. And it was an incredible period of time. You know, the, the largest obstacle, which we had not foreseen, really was the side effects of the medications. Um, if any of you can invent something like prednisone without the side effects, you know, you've got it made. <laughs> um, they're pretty bad. But he, you know, he had sort of a mixed review. He couldn't, it was hard for him that he couldn't be on time to anything anymore, like his sense of time wasn't good. But on the other hand, ice cream tasted great for the first time in his life. Um, so we had a good couple of years. And then one Sunday morning, um, he woke up with a very high fever. And when you have a suppressed immune system, you have to call about that stuff right away. So we did, and he went over to the hospital, grumbling, of course, because it was a Sunday, and his real doctors wouldn't be there. Um, but he went in, and unfortunately, the next morning, he woke up on a ventilator, because something was just ravaging his lungs. And it turned out to be a rare form of pneumonia, and the doctors worked around the clock to fight it for two weeks. And we were really hoping, and the transplant team was really hoping, and equally important, Dr. Stuhlbarg was being realistic. Um, and one night, he came, and he took me into his office, and he sat down with me, and he said, I know you guys, and I know you'd want to know. And he said, you know, Stephen's chances are not good. Um, and it was the worst conversation of my life, but it was also a conversation I'm incredibly grateful for, because he really allowed Stephen's family and me to decide how Stephen's last few days here on Earth would play out. There's nothing really more important to help someone with than their last few days. Um, we couldn't take him up to the mountains or anything, but we could be with him, you know, and he had always said that the people you love are the most important thing, and we were there. Um, so it turns out, you know, just because someone's no longer here doesn't mean you stop talking to them. <laughs> um, and after Stephen died, and our life kind of slowed down, my life kind of slowed down, I imagined myself talking to him about everything we'd been through and asking him, you know, do you think it was right? Like, was the transplant a good idea? And did you really want no machines in that last final moment? Um, and sometimes I would imagine him really weighing those possibilities. And sometimes I'd imagine him sort of impatient with the question. You know, it maybe wasn't about whether they were the perfect decisions, but they were our decisions. And in that crazy kind of life, and maybe in any life, that's what you do. You make it yours, and you try to shape it in the same way that it's shaping you. Um, so that life still stays with me. And I'm going to close by reading a little bit about that. Um, to know the context, you have to know about one decision I did make, which is highly embarrassing and probably highly questionable. But um, the day Stephen was dying, my friend Elizabeth came to me and said, I heard on the radio about this woman whose husband died, and she saved his sperm so she could have kids later. And I was like, OK. <laughs> um, and I know it is weird and distasteful. Um, and to the hospital's credit, you know, they make you have this like four-hour hour meeting with both families and sign paperwork and wait a year to do anything with the sperm. But I, yes, I did do that. It did feel also like just having some life on that day. And I thought Stephen, in some ways, would have appreciated it. Um, so I'm going to read from um, the book I wrote about our life together. And this is at the end. <laughs> um, this is nine years later. So I've remarried, and I have two young children. A letter from the urology department at UCSF has been sitting on my desk for months. The department is moving, and in the process of sorting and collecting what they need to take to their new site, they found something that belongs to me, or 50 million things that belong to me. It doesn't seem right that they're mine, but they're mine more than they are anyone else's. The letter reads, it has come to our attention that we are storing a frozen sample belonging to your deceased husband. The letter sits five feet away from my sleeping three-year-old son, who lies in his bed, oblivious to the life that was mine before he was though that will come, and maybe soon. Recently, he overheard a piece of conversation and his head whirled around. Two husbands, he said. If Stephen could look in on my life now, I think he'd understand what I need to do about the letter. He'd see me with a family in deep. There's room, my second husband said early on, before he was my husband. And maybe if he hadn't said this, if he'd been more possessive and less self-possessed, I would have had to forget my old life completely. But I was grieving when I met him and he probably understood better than I did, it was all of me or none. Still, he has his limits. 
We'd only been together a few months when the frozen sample came up somehow. I think you should know, I'm not up for that, he said. And in a way, it was a relief. I wasn't up for it either. But I'm having trouble checking the donate to science box and mailing the letter in. When it comes to Stephen's belongings, the closer something is to having been part of him, the harder it is to give away. And this is as close to being him as something could be. Though I can hear him laughing at that. You're kidding, he'd say. You feel bad for the frozen sample? But I can't help feeling like I'm in charge of part of his life. And it's a fragment of the way I felt all those years ago when Dr. Golden sat me down in the hospital hallway. I knew what Stephen wanted, but I still had the feeling I have now, like I'm in the emergency exit row of an airplane, and I'm not sure I'll be good at the job, but I don't trust anyone else to do it better. If we'd lived 50 years ago, there would have been nothing for me to decide, no machines to keep him alive, no procedure to take his sperm. His body would have been able to die on its own terms, but we never would have met. He'd have died long before high school. I watched my son sleeping, thinking about that between worlds place where I used to live and how far I am from it now. Though I carry where I've been with me in the deep way that we all do. The fact that my kids play hospital when I needed to think of a fun, expansive game that could include a one-year-old and a three-year-old, I didn't think restaurant or office or house. I can see doctor, a friend said, but hospital? The fact that I still can't convince myself that the future exists. I want it to, and I hope it does, but there's no part of my brain that feels comfortable thinking 20 years out. The fact that if my second husband, Cullen, is out late and I've expected him earlier, I don't imagine an accident or an affair the way most people might. My mind jumps past worry. It's all over. I love this person dearly, and now he's been taken away. Ironically, as soon as Stephen died, because he died, I understood him better. I feel now about the people I love the way Stephen felt then about me. My innocence about death is gone, and it's better than it sounds. I don't wake up at night trembling. I don't have interfering thoughts about disasters. Maybe I'm an optimist at heart. I'm an optimist who knows her days are numbered, who thinks of life as a sidewalk, that easy to step off of, that fast. I don't imagine the plane crashing when I fly, but I also don't imagine myself at 70 without inserting the words if or hope into the equation. But weirdly, it just doesn't bother me that much. In fact, if anything, I like it. I think about death and I feel deeply alive, and I must have inherited this from Stephen. The fact that I think of Stephen as having lived fully, even though I'm older now, and should be able to see everything he didn't get to have. But the life felt full when it was happening, and it's still hard for me to think of it in any other way. It's hard to explain. It was difficult, but not lacking. I remember it as a great life, really. And no matter how much time I spend in a more normal existence, that doesn't seem to change. The fact that I can't just mail in this letter. It seems like there must be something better, more specific to do with the sperm than donated to science. I don't know what area of science the urology department has in mind. And it occurs to me that if the sample would be useful to anyone, it would be CF researchers. There may be researchers out there who want to examine sperm with DNA encoded for CF. And if so, they are hard pressed for material. Men with CF have no vast deference, so the only way to extract their sperm is through aspiration, which involves a long needle to the testicles. It's hard to imagine anyone signing up for that study. So I call the CF clinic and I leave a message, letting them know that I have the sample and asking if they know of a research team who might want it. It is sort of a weird thing to do, but the doctors have known me for years over there. I'm not too embarrassed. Besides, the whole situation is weird. Stephen lived on the frontier of modern medicine, which is a weird place to live. And this is the kind of death that follows that kind of life, messy and strange and terrible and lucky. Thank you. Questions, comments, thoughts, stories? Thanks, Larry. I actually have a minor question. OK, sure. Did his politics about bombing ever get better? <laughs> I don't know, but I, you know, I, I have age, so I feel like I can, I can talk about it a little better now than I used to. Yeah. Others? Other questions? Paula? You were 
you were clearly educated about his disease and the um, sort of new types of, of medicines that were possibly going to be available. Did you ever feel a tension to not go there and to not be involved in things? And how did you talk about that? And how did you deal with that? And how did you explain that to your family? To not do procedure to... Yeah, I was just yeah. wondering, how, how yeah. do you... How do you not do absolutely yes. everything no matter and that's the cost? A huge, yes, that's a huge question and a, and a problem, really, because there are all these things that are presented to you as options. And um, for instance, the gene therapy study that I thought, you know, my personal, I can't handle this in my personal life. Um, but also things that feel risky or just feel um, like they're going to take away from the quality of your life. Um, and I do think, you know, Stephen and I were going to write a book about this together. And then he got the transplant. And we were so happy to not be thinking about CF that we were like, forget it, <laughs> you know? And it was only years later that I wanted to think about it again because we did reach quite a saturation point with it. Um, and my own field wasn't healthcare, and I appreciated that. You know, I was in education and writing, um, and I think I was kind of surprised that he wanted to go into it, but it's a very different angle. I think he so appreciated the healthcare that he got and wanted everyone to have, you know, that possibility. Others? Yes, over here? Here, I'll use my microphone. Um, thank you. That was um, magical. Um, okay. I have my, um, my own Stephen that was my journey in the same way he had ALS. Th there's something you said that I, I think actually might be worth amplifying that, that I experience when I talk to people with the disease now, which is this balance of hope and reality in, in therapy. And, you know, when you're, when you're in a disease where all of the options are experimental and are not, you know, really available or mainstream and people are on that bleeding edge, yeah. um, it's a very hard place for people to make rational decisions. Oh, it's so hard. Yep. And, and um, you know, I think that there's something that, that you, you said that and I think it's really important for people to understand is that the trying to help someone go through that is, is really, it takes an immense compassion and immense thinking. And... And um, what I sometimes say, and this is now you know, a decade later, um, is that, that you can only go through two or three cycles. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're going to hear about this quack therapy that they want to do in Switzerland, or this, or that, or the other thing. And, and just I ask people to invest well, that, that you really can only do it two or three times. And whether it's a supplement, or a clinical trial, or whatever it is, the process is really, it's amazing. It's, it's a gift, but it's also incredibly painful. And ask people to invest well. And I think that's really hard for people to understand how difficult that is, because the perspective you have in that moment is so deep and so intense and, and so out of the normal that, that I think people, the helping people through that is really critical. So. Well, it's interesting you say that, you. because when I look back, it's hard for me to think, you know, I, it's an honest question. Was the transplant worth it? You know, we got a little less than two years, and in my life now, I mean, two years goes by fast, you know, but it didn't then. And I think what Stephen got out of it almost more than anything was being able to escape the slow decline that he saw in front of him. Um, and I don't know, you know, I, I still, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, it was worth it if years from now, people can have lung transplant and they can go very smoothly. It, it's, still, it's still not working perfectly, but. David? Yes, <clears throat> there's a lot being written now about caregivers and the impact of caregiving on the caregiver. You've talked a lot about the process. You've talked a lot about what you did with Stephen and what you did after. What did you do to protect yourself during and after? Mm. How did you deal That's with... That's a very good question. What did you, how did you deal with your frustration, your sadness, your fears, yeah. your hope? I mean, you talked a little well, bit about we, that. Well, someone mentioned community. Um, so we had a very tight-knit community of family and friends, and there is no way I could have gotten through what I did without them. I mean, that helped me survive, um, having people that I loved and cared about me, and also being somewhat selfish. I mean, in a way, you know, being 21 <laughs> and new to marriage, I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to go to grad school. I'm going to study something. I mean, I was very much, um, and Stephen supported that, so I think I did have my own vision and my own drive. Um, and I also think he was a very self-sufficient person, and so he didn't ask a lot of me in terms of, I mean, the role, of course, over time, 
I had a huge role, but I remember the first time he went in the hospital and I didn't know what to do. And I got there, I was like, should I not go to work today? And he said, why would you do that? I'm like, I have to be here. You don't have to be here. Go, like, go be in the world and enjoy yourself, you know? And that was really his attitude. Um, and over time, I had more of that attitude myself. I mean, you, he went through so many different procedures and so many hospitalizations that we just had to go about it as if that was normal life. And I would only worry, I only didn't work when he was in the ICU. Because if he was in the regular hospital, it was just like life, you know. I went to work and I remember getting to the hospital and the nurse, you know, just the nurses would be like, well, you look pretty good. And I was like, oh yeah, I just went for a run. And they'd kind of give me this look like, well, you know, you went for a run, your husband's in the hospital. It's like, damn right I went for a run, you know. Um, you need to, you need to, you have to take care of yourself. Others? Yes, please. We'll have a microphone in a second. Thank you for uh, sharing uh, what you have told us. And the slides also, it's really wonderful to place oh, it in, okay. in context. Um, I have a question for you with regards to the realization that you're not indestructible yeah. gives time a very different meaning. Say that last Gives thing time a very different meaning. The preciousness of yeah. what you can do. Yeah. How was that for you? How was that for Stephen? Because you had different time. Yes. Well, we were very different because I was young with the vantage point of a young person, you know, and he was, um, he always had his mortality up close. Um, you know, I remember one time when we were 23 or 24, he said to me, you know, well, in the end, the people that you love are the most important thing. And I was in grad school thinking about educational policy and I was like, gosh, well, maybe you just haven't had a job that you really loved. And he just said, oh, you know, when you're 70, you'll get it. <laughs> um, and there was that reality difference for us, you know, and we did have to bridge that difference between us. Um, I think being with him, the preciousness of time was contagious. Uh, so I think I did absorb a lot of that, and I still, that stays with me. You know, um, I look at my kids, and, and I mean, not to say they don't drive me crazy, because they're kids, and they do. Um, likewise, my husband, you know, but I have a feeling about them that is like, ooh, I want this time with you. You know, I don't know how much time we're going to get. Um, and that's just kind of part of me now, I guess. Yeah. We have time for one more. Yes, Clarissa in the back. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so not, thank you so much for sharing that. I've been sitting here just crying the entire time. Oh, no. So it's, no, I okay. think it's a good thing. So thank you. Um, I just wanted you, if you're willing, to speak to how you fell in love again. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, I can speak to that if you want. Um, it was on a soccer field. <laughs> uh, and um, it was much sooner than I would have predicted after Stephen died. It was about a year after he died. Um, which, you know, for some reason in my head, I had seven years, because they tell you, like, it'll take you seven years to get through a death. So I thought, well, you know, I'm not even going to date for seven years. Um, I was 30, and, uh, or 29 when he died. And I met, th my brother had moved out to Berkeley to help me talk about community. He moved in my house, helped me with the dogs, like, took care of me, basically, while I worked. And um, so we were playing pickup soccer, and I said to my brother, like, there was something really weird about that guy in the field. My brother was like, yeah, it's called being attracted to someone. <laughs> and he was like, has it really been that long? <laughs> and I was like, no, I mean, not like that, like really weird. You know? And he was like, OK, it's called being attracted to someone and having the possibility that it could actually go somewhere. And um, I was shocked. You know? <laughs> it was, like, uh, it was a really terrifying for me. Um, but you know, we started going out, and we went out. And after having fallen in love the first time, I just knew pretty soon. Um, I mean, it, you know, it, we didn't get married for another couple years, but, um, and my second husband, he was, so you don't stop grieving at a year out, you know, I was still deep in the throes of grief, and um, he was, and is just a wonderful person. He would hate hearing that, because he really gets annoyed when people ask, like, how do, you know, how do you do this, like, with her, he's like, I just love you, and, you know, he died, and I'm here, and it's not, it's pretty, he's very pragmatic um, as well, but, um, yeah, it just, it happened pretty quickly, and there was a lot that I processed through that, um, being with him. And, and now, you know, Stephen is still part of my life, and he's part of my kids' lives. We're still close to his family. 
Um, we still spend time with them. And um, my new husband is close to his family, so I've had the luck of a bunch of people who are willing to be connected. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Look at this.